Hi, I'm Laura Colarusso, the Digital Managing Editor for WGBH News. With me tonight is Joel Clement, the former Director of the Office of Policy for the Department of the Interior. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. I, I wanted to start with just sort of the circumstances surrounding your departure from the department. If you could fill us in on that briefly. Yeah, so this summer, June 15th, I received an email actually quite late at night on the 15th uh, informing me that I had just been involuntarily uh, reassigned. Uh, to the Office of Natural Resources Revenue, which is the office at Interior uh, that collects and disperses oil and gas and mining royalty uh, checks from industry. Mm -hmm. uh, previous to that, of course, in the policy office, I had been the climate change lead, so this was quite a change. Right, and you wound up writing a piece in the, new, in the Washington Post that went viral, and then you left not, not long after that, correct? And that's right. In July, I filed a whistleblower complaint, and at the same time, published an op-ed in the Washington Post explaining why I was filing the whistleblower complaint, why I felt that I was being retaliated against for my work on uh, the climate change impacts on the Alaska Natives in the Arctic. And then in October, three months later, I did ultimately resign from the department. Okay. I have this sense from growing up and learning about American history about how science used to really be a great sort of um, motivator, it sort of propelled us forward. I'm thinking specifically about the space race w with President Kennedy and how the country kind of galvanized around that. And now today it feels like with issues like climate change or even fracking, maybe even GMOs, that science is used more now as an obstacle. And this isn't a Democrat or a Republican issue, it's sort of just a political issue where more and more I'm hearing from our leaders, um, the, the science isn't settled. We can't move forward because we don't know what the science really says. And I just wanted to get a sense from you if you kind of agree with that. On many issues like this, it's very fashionable right now for the political leadership to say, oh, well, we don't know about the science. Uh, th they are using the science as an excuse. Uh, they're using uh, that language that, oh, hey, I'm not a scientist, I don't know, or the science isn't settled. But in fact, it is. Uh, so it's really just an obstructionist approach because they want to make sure that the science doesn't interfere in many cases with, uh, with the operations of industry or special interests. When do you think that change happened? When do you think science became more of an obstacle? Well, you know, this, this anti-intellectualism trend has been going on for a long time. There are books, uh, dozens of books about it, right? I remember during the, the Bush administration, it was when they first started trotting out some of these lines about uh, the science isn't settled. Um, so it's not a new thing, but the Trump administration has taken it to incredible new lows uh, by just providing full-on falsehoods and denying very well-established fact and science. You were just in Bonn, and the government of Sweden sponsored your trip there, I think. Um, can you talk a little bit about your role there uh, and what you presented, if you presented? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was invited by Sweden and the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, because we had worked together quite a lot on Arctic resilience issues. And that's one of the issues that I worked on extensively at the Department of the Interior. And what we were presenting on was the Arctic Resilience Report that the United States and Sweden had co-chaired mm -hmm. uh, and delivered uh, right after uh, the election last year, actually, in Stockholm. Uh, so I was presenting on that. Uh, I was not representing Sweden in negotiations or anything like that. I wasn't on there. Uh, negotiating delegation, but I was there as the team of experts and scientists that's presenting on the issues of concern to Sweden. And I think also uh, it was important for me to be there uh, for a variety of other reasons. Uh, being an American at this COP23, it's called this year, uh, in Bonn, meant a lot because the government, of course, the U.S. government, wasn't showing up. Uh, they, they, of course, they're there. They had a little room with a paper sign on the door. But usually there's a big pavilion a lot of presentations and a lot of talk about uh, what's happening with climate change. And this year, none of that, except there's a shadow delegation of Americans there that has been doing some amazing things. Yeah, well, Very actually, that was my next question. Okay. I wanted to ask about that. Yeah. Um, it, there was, Mike Bloomberg was there, um, Jerry Brown from California, um, Ed Markey from Massachusetts, and uh, I saw some of their interviews, and they, they seemed very adamant that the U.S. is still in, that we're still going to be moving towards um, Paris Accord goals. Without the support of the federal government, what good can individual senators, governors, congressmen make it for a problem that's this large? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I, I came away from Bonn feeling incredibly invigorated by this shadow delegation, because what they were representing is this thing called America's Pledge, and that's 20 states 
uh, over 100 cities, uh, a couple thousand corporations that combined their, their, their GDP is, would be the third largest country in the world, right? So they all have committed to CO2 targets. And it was amazing to see. And all the other delegations who, were, who had come to Bonn expecting the U.S. to bomb were incredibly lifted up and impressed by this. So I was proud to see what you can do outside of the federal government. There are some issues you need the feds on board, but when it comes to cutting back on CO2, if they're not going to lead, these other people will, and it's impressive to see it happen. There's been a lot of talk about how, given that we've pulled out of the Paris Accord, that uh, we're ceding leadership to China and other countries. Did the delegation, the shadow delegation, sort of step into that void? Do you think that maybe we haven't lost as much of a leadership role? or That's exactly what happened, in my view. They stepped in. In fact, the Trump administration was so absent they created a void that was perfect opportunity for these folks to step in. And so in effect, I think the Trump effect on this year's climate conference has been a net positive, as ironic as that sounds, because not only has it created this opening for some real ambition to step in, but the other countries are really impressed. Uh, and they're, they're, they're glad to be part of that now, and they're increasing their ambition as well. You, so you started uh, your role at the Department of Interior under the Obama administration, and so I wanted to ask you, what are some things you wish the Obama administration had done differently with respect to climate change? Well, you know, it, the Obama administration got off to a slow start on climate change, largely because Congress was so aligned uh, against action on climate change. I remember uh, in those for, in that for, during that first term, after Congress flipped to the Republicans, uh, the House, uh, it was very difficult to even use terms like climate change in budget documents because Congress controls the budgets. And ultimately, every agency has to look to those appropriators on the Hill and say, please uh, fund these projects. And if they're not going to be friendly to climate change, you have to be careful what you say. So it wasn't as though uh, we got off to a strong start in the Obama administration. There were other issues at hand, the health care and other things. Uh, and it was an extremely, it's a political minefield, of course, with Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was difficult, but boy, those last few years, uh, the administration really got up to speed, started to deliver, and, uh, and, and really doubled down on the issue. So it established the foundation upon which uh, this group, of this shadow delegation now in, in Bonn, is able to advance. Um, can you describe the moment, going back to your leaving the Department of Interior, can you describe the moment when it became untenable to stay? What was the straw that broke the camel's back? You know, there were so many things happening then, and I can't point to one straw, but I will say that uh, when the secretary uh, was speaking to a room full of petroleum executives and he said, gosh, you know, I don't think I have the loyalty of some 30% of the department. I don't think they're saluting the flag here. Uh, we all groaned, a collective groan about that sort of arrogance that, come on, we're not here to salute you Mr. Secretary, we're here, we're serving the people of the country, we're serving the Constitution, we're implementing the laws of Congress, we're not here to, to salute the, the figure that's sitting in the big office upstairs. And it was just that kind of arrogance and, and ignorance about the mission of the agency that set me off. And I realized that they're not going to put me in a position at any point where I'm going to have a voice. I need to step away. Uh, I was more worried about losing my voice than, than the job that they had put me in. I'd already essentially lost the job that I was there to do. Right. So you made a calculation that you feel you could do more on the outside of government than in. That's right. That, for example, there's no way I could have gone to Bonn uh, while being part of the U.S. government, right? They weren't going to send a delegation, certainly anyone from uh, Interior. And in this way, I was able to go represent the interests of climate resilience and climate adaptation and talk with these folks about what we need to do next and to increase our ambition. I wouldn't have been part of that show by any stretch. Right. I mean, do you worry that the Alaska natives that you were uh, working to help might not have an advocate now within Very the government? Worried. Ultimately, that's why I blew the whistle on the Trump administration, because there's no one doing that job now. There's no one in Washington organizing the federal agencies to advance the ball and to relocate those villages. So this time of year, right now, is storm season up there, and there's no pack ice offshore to buffer those storms. So one big storm can spin up on the Bering Sea and wipe a village right off the map. So we, we worry, generally, those of us that work on this a lot this time of year, and they don't have an advocate in D.C. They do have people that are attending things like the COP in Bonn. There are some people from the Pacific Islands and the people from the Arctic to represent these ideas, 
but no leadership from the federal government to push them through. Okay. And do you worry at all? Um, I mean, there was the science march back in April. Do you worry about science or scientists becoming more politically involved and what that sort of means for research? It doesn't bother me. I, I think it's fine for scientists to, to use their voices. I think, you know, these are some of the, the smartest, most analytical minds in the country, and I don't object at all to them using uh, their, their information and their knowledge to advance public policy. In fact, I think public policy absolutely must depend on science. And it doesn't mean that they're being activists, they're just advocating for science, and I think that's important. Do you ever plan to run for office someday? I do not plan to run for office. Okay. <laughs> all right, that's it. Those are all my questions. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah.